Hey there, it's Captain Roger from the Grass Valley Corps of the Salvation Army. Thank you so much for joining us here online. Just as a reminder, if you'd ever like to join us in person, we do meet at our Alta Street location, 11 a.m. every Sunday morning to uh, spend some time together in worship and fellowship and studying the Word of God, and we would just love to have you there. Uh, Easter is coming up in two weeks, and hey... What a great day to come together and celebrate the resurrection of the Son of God and eat jelly beans and maybe chocolate bunnies. Yeah. Anyway, grace and peace to each and every one of you. Uh, I hope you've got your Bibles handy. We're going to go to Acts chapter, uh, you know what, let's go to Acts chapter 5 today. We're going to start, we're going to look at the last verse of Acts chapter 5 before we look at anything else. The last verse of Acts 5 says, Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They never stopped. Well, who is they? They, in this uh, particular instance, would be the apostles, the disciples, the early followers of Jesus. This group of five to seven to maybe 10,000 people who had come together in Jerusalem and spent their time uh, either doing what they did to get by, with, you know, making a living, doing their job, but all their spare time they spent in the temple teaching and letting people know about Jesus, both his life and his death and his resurrection. Every day they gathered in the temple. Every day they taught about Jesus. Every day they were there. They were performing signs and wonders. That means healing the sick, casting out impure spirits, and telling people all about this new way of life that is based on love instead of law. And the believers, they looked after one another. They even made sacrifices like sharing everything they had and, and even selling property so that everyone in their community could have all that they needed. And the people around them saw this and recognized how unusual it was. I mean, this kind of care and commitment, it was amazing and attractive. People respected it. And they wanted to be a part of it. And, and as they saw the way of Jesus being lived out, they came to believe in his power and his resurrection, and they responded by turning their lives over to this way as well. More and more people were added to the number who believed. We're told that in a few spots. Now, remember that Jesus was a Jew. The promise of the Messiah was a Jewish promise. All of the first followers that Lucas told us about so far were Jewish people who were committed to their faith. Jesus, to them, he was this long-awaited figure who had been promised to them by God way before the time of Moses. The, the new way of life they were trying to emulate was really the way that things could have been all along, if only they had understood how God's covenant was meant to be worked out. Have you ever heard of breathing coaches? Breathing coaches, these are literally people who teach you how to breathe. I mean, does that sound dumb? Uh, we all breathe, right? Sure, it's automatic. Uh, until it, it's not. And, and then we're all dead, right? Yeah, well, yes, but also no. Um, how we breathe when we are mindful is very different from how we breathe automatically. At least it is for most people. When we breathe mindfully, it changes things. It can alter our thoughts. It could change our state of mind or our energy levels, even our physical capabilities. Does that sound crazy? Well, if you ever take an anger management class, one of the first things you will probably be taught is how to use your breathing to calm and control your state of mind. Take a deep breath. Count to 10. Just breathe. It's the same with athletes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, swimming is probably the easiest example of how important it can be to breathe in the right way. Because if you don't, when you're swimming, you'll drown. But breathing in an intentional, measured way affects the performance of sprinters or of marathoners, too. 
Champions in professional sports from football to basketball to archery or even skiing, they all use breathing exercises to train themselves to be better at what they do. There's even evidence that practicing deeper, slower breathing can help sharpen your thinking and possibly even extend your life. This is what was happening in the lives of those new believers who were coming to Jesus. It, it was like they were learning a new way of breathing, one in which they could mindfully breathe in the things of God, his spirit filling them and then breathe the love of Jesus out to the world. And Jews from all throughout God's people came together to learn how to live life together with this shared breath or spirit. But there were some problems along the way. Acts chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 1. In those days... When the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. All right, got to do some explaining here, I bet. With one thing and another, the centuries leading up to this time that Luke is writing about had seen the Jewish people scattered across the known world. The Assyrians and Babylonians had departed them. Um had departed them, excuse me, had deported them. I guess it's kind of the same thing, but the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they had deported the Jewish people by force when they invaded the different sections of Israel. And when that great exile ended, not everyone had returned to Judah. I mean, it had been, uh, the Babylonian exile was more than 70 years long. People had a whole new lives established and not everyone had that yearning to be back in their homeland, even if it was God's promised land. Then the Greeks came along and they spread their civilization around the known world, and the, the Romans made it easier than ever before to travel between cities in the empire. And Jewish communities, they'd come to exist in towns across the known world. Along the way, though, there had been one big rift that came about. Many of those who lived outside of Israel grew up in a Greek culture that spoke the language of the world, which was Greek, of course. Well, those who were born or grew up in the area around Israel and much of the Eastern Mediterranean, they spoke Aramaic as their primary tongue. And there were a few who probably spoke both and a few who could get by a bit in either language, but for the most part, it was groups of people who lived in essentially two different worlds. Hellenistic Jews were those who spoke Greek. They often had lived somewhere outside of Israel for most or all of their lives. But a trend was occurring where Israelites approaching the end of their life were moving to Jerusalem to spend their last days or years near the temple. It was a way of coming back to the land of their ancestors and a chance to be close to their God and their people. Now, these folks, they worshipped in their own synagogues where Greek was spoken, including one called the Synagogue of the Freedmen, which we will hear a little about next week. For now, what is important to know is that there are some divisions like, like language, which are really hard to overcome. But if the people are going to be together as one, they can't leave a chasm separating them from one another. They have to find a way to build a bridge to get across to each other, right? Uh, so look at, uh, uh, look at, look at verse two. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. I interrupt again. Uh, taking care of widows and orphans was the responsibility of the extended family. And in the community that the followers of Jesus were building, that made it everyone's responsibility. But 
the twelve were certain that their primary responsibility was sharing the message of Jesus by teaching about him and his ways and acting as witnesses to the life they had shared with him and, and all that. No matter how much you want to do everything, you can't do it. You can't do everything. You have to choose some priorities. I, I gotta tell you, I, I'm, I'm not complaining and I don't want this to come across as a humble brag. This is just the way it is. I face this problem a lot. I once made a list of the primary responsibilities of a Salvation Army officer for uh, an advisory board member who asked what it is that we do with our time. And I stopped listing things when I got to three pages. But uh, that was well before I'd put everything down that we are expected to do. Now, my first priority should be spiritual development. But sometimes it seems like my job is more about ordering paper clips and making copies and answering the phone. And those are all important things. But they can block sight of the most important thing if I'm not careful. And that's what the 12 are afraid of. They're not saying that they're too good to bring a meal to someone in need. They're saying that in a large community, they are not the best people to be doing that task. And so they continued in verse 3. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. See, sharing responsibilities means everyone has more time to work on being excellent at what they do. By the way, take note of how they dealt with this situation because it's brilliant. They spent exactly zero time on determining whether this was a big or a small problem or whose fault it was or wasn't, or even this was, if this was a problem at all, or if it was just someone's perception. What they did is they just acknowledged the issue being brought to them by brainstorming a solution and proposing it. Hey, we all agree this is important, but we can't give it the attention it deserves. Let's get some qualified folks in to take charge. They'll handle this and we'll focus on this other thing that we're better at. Make sense? Yeah, that seems to have made sense to everyone because verse five says, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Hmm. So the apostles, forgive me, <clears throat> the apostles asked for them to choose folks who were filled with the spirit. And here Luke makes a point of telling us Stephen was known to be filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. These seven were people who were known to breathe the breath of God. What had at first glance appeared like it could be a huge problem in this gathering of believers now has a spirit-filled solution to make them whole again. And I want to point something out here. The seven seem to have been nominated or elected by the group as a whole to deal with the problem of Greek-speaking widows not being supported in the way that they needed to be. For good or for bad, whether everyone agreed there was a problem or not, putting this group in charge of distributing food to people in need was the solution that they all agreed would be best. Now, I suspect there were some who voted for other people who may have been disappointed, but this is the group that was brought up and the 12 prayed for them and laid hands on them and then sent them to take charge of that distribution. The assignment they're given is no less an important religious duty than the one that the 12 have. I want to make that perfectly clear. God says across at least 30 separate verses in the Hebrew scriptures, that's the, the Old Testament to you and I, uh, he says that he considers the care of widows and orphans and those from other lands and anyone else who is oppressed or rejected to be a vital part of life on his path. I'm going to say that again to make sure that no one missed it. God makes it clear across at least 30 separate verses in the Hebrew scriptures from the beginning to the end that he considers the care of widows 
and orphans and those from other lands and anyone else who is oppressed or rejected to be a vital, crucial, important, unchangingly a thing, part of life on God's path. He wrote it into his covenant. He held it up as a virtue in his Proverbs. He had it preached about by his prophets. It is part of the care that Jesus required of his followers. It is not an unimportant job. These seven are not doing it alone. They are just the people who will oversee what's being done in a way that makes sure no one is missed in the future. Just like the mission that I follow as an officer in the Salvation Army, they are there to meet human needs in Jesus' name without discrimination. All right. What came before isn't important. Life can only be lived from this moment forward, right? You can't live backwards and fix what happened before. You can only say, all right, I'm going to just start right here. This is where we're at. This is where we're going. Let's get there. But look who they chose. Look who they chose to do this. All seven of the men have Greek names. As Dr. Ben Witherington says in his commentary on Acts, this seems to suggest that the community as a whole, in order to avoid even the appearance of favoritism, named mostly, if not exclusively, Greek-speaking Jewish Christians to administer the food distribution. I mean, who better to ensure that any oppression never occurs again than leaders chosen from among the oppressed? Now, the, the last question this should leave us with is whether this was a God-honoring decision. Well, how can we know that? Easy. We know whether something is godly by the fruit that it produces. Well, what kind of fruit did the appointment of the seven produce? Look at verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What we see here is that the church's response to heal this threat to its unity leads to more growth, which we will see throughout the book of Acts is a symbol of God's blessing. I'm not saying that things have to grow to show that God is blessing them. I'm saying that in Acts, that is one of the, the pointers that Luke uses to show that God is blessing what is being done, right? When a gathering of believers allows divisions to separate them, God's not in that. So people fall away or just plain leave and avoid the church. It always happens. There's some argument and these people say, well, I'm going to go here. And these people, I'm going to go there. And uh, the next thing you know, you know, half of the people have just left because they're not going to go one way or the other. They can't believe the people of God would do this. And so they walk away. Division separates people, not just from each other, but from God. When we, as a church, stick to the message of Jesus, that we are all God's beloved children, worthy of love, that we can find ways to get along as we journey together. When we stick to that message, when we actually live that out, what happens is others outside of our gathering will find that kind of thing to be attractive. And they'll realize that the name of Jesus is the power of resurrection for individuals, for groups, and for whole communities when they trust in him. There in Jerusalem, by some estimates, in that first century period we're talking about, there were about 18,000 priests and temple workers in and around the city. And as they saw the actions of the followers of Jesus, and they witnessed the wonders done in his name, both the miraculous and the merely amazing, and they heard the, the apostles preaching the message Jesus had taught them about how all of this Old Testament prophecy and teaching and everything pointed directly to Jesus and his death and resurrection, 
these priests, these religious leaders, these authorities, these people who were well studied, they began to see this and hear this and take it in and recognize there was truth here. And more and more of them began to accept and preach the good news that Jesus was the Messiah they had all been waiting for. And they, along with those they would influence to follow, began to breathe the Holy Spirit in their lives too. Which is what I want to call each and every one of you to do as well. Just breathe. Breathe in the things of God. Being here is one way. Spending time reading and understanding the word is another way. Focusing on allowing those you may have rejected or shut out or ignored is another. Finding ways to avoid or heal rifts. Breathe in the things of God and then breathe out the love of Jesus. Offer what you can to help those who have need. Feed the hungry. Offer a cup of water to a thirsty soul. Sometimes all it takes is a kind word or a listening ear or a smile or an acknowledgement that someone is there, that they are alive. Maybe just remind yourself that person you're about to criticize or insult or ignore or reject. The image of God is in them just like it's in you. Breathe in the things of God. Breathe out the love of Jesus. Just breathe. Pray this with me, if you will. Lord God, Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, which you have sent to give each of us the ability to truly breathe, have mercy on us. So often we take in the evil of the world and then exhale it back out to those around us, be that with hurtful words or by refusing to share kindnesses that we are perfectly capable of extending. We ask that you help us to be mindful of our breathing. Instead, teach us to take you into our souls and breathe you out into the world. Help us to seek ways to remain one with your people and with every other person in your creation as well. Remind us of the example Jesus provided and of the positive examples of his followers too. Especially those examples from the early church, Lord. All those people who learned from Christ directly help us to become like Jesus by emulating those we see or read about or hear about who are working on just that. And help us to love, not just because we must, but simply because we can. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, because we know that you will be faithful to provide all of these things so long as we are faithful to seek and use them. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey. You got any uh, comments, questions, or final thoughts that you want to put out here? You know what? Stick them in the comments on this page or shoot me an email. I'm always happy to talk about it. Or like I said, we meet in person every Sunday morning, 11 a.m. You can always come by. We take questions all the way through our service. I know, kind of weird, but it's a thing. We would much rather answer the questions people have than just preach at you, right? Wherever you go this week, remember, you have nothing to fear because God is already there. Go with God. Grace and peace to each and every one of you.